Hello, folks, and welcome back to another edition of Compound Interests. I am John Najarian, and I know you're going to be delighted to listen to Kevin O'Leary. He's not only Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank, but he is the chairman of O'Shares and Beanstalks. And he's going to tell us about those two companies, one of them, of course, an ETF or exchange traded fund producer, as well as Beanstalks, which is a great way to automatically put a little money aside every week or every month that you invest in your future. I think it's a fabulous discussion about that, about financial literacy, about O'Leary fine wines, which we get to, as well as microdosing, because uh, one of the companies we talked about um, is a company that has been doing fantastic work about ADHD, about PTSD, and how you can treat it by microdosing things like uh, LSD and mushrooms. I think you're really going to be surprised about that. And by the way, that company is up 400% in the last three months since I interviewed, interviewed rather that chairman. So I'd encourage you to not only listen to Compound Interests, but give us a thumbs up wherever you're listening, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify. Give us a five-star review, if you will, folks, and make sure you share it with a friend. Again, this is Compound Interests and our discussion with Mr. Wonderful, Kevin O'Leary. Folks, uh, I, I know you know a lot about Kevin's investing prowess, and we're going to talk about that for sure. But I wanted to also talk about some of the things that he's done most recently. Um, now, obviously, he continues to invest. Uh, Shark Tank remains one of the most popular shows on both ABC and then replays over on CNBC. We were smart enough to grab that. Uh, but Kevin, you've uh, been involved in a company called Beanstalks. And since we talk stocks on CNBC all the time, I thought it would be great for investors and just viewers, fans of yours, to hear a little bit more about Beanstalks because it's an automated wealth management tool that you've been part of and really have been pushing it to the forefront uh, because it makes sense, because it's a, a smart way to invest. So if you don't mind breaking it down a little bit for us, I think the viewers and listeners would love to hear about it. You know, the... the what really brought this forward for me, you know, I've got over 50 companies now that I'm an investor in, all kinds in almost every state, 56 of them to be specific. And we have huge supply chains, you know, we manufacture products. I'm in the gym equipment business and I'm in the cupcake business and the greeting card business and all these different companies, many from Shark Tank and many I've just invested on my own. So we hit the pandemic. And in March, and I'm, I'm helping all these companies because our revenues basically went to zero when retail shut down. And I'm helping them with their PPPs. And I'm working with the different banks and financial services agents to get all these loans set up. And here's what really freaked me out. For the first time ever, because I've been doing this for over a decade, I start to realize that my employees and the employees of my supply chains have nothing saved. They've got two weeks worth of cash in their bank accounts. They have no long-term strategy. They're panicking because all of a sudden they're worried they're going to lose their jobs. And I start digging into this situation. There are 100 million Americans with no investment strategy, no plan for what happens when they get older, no setting aside anything to invest in. And, and at that time, you know, uh, obviously I was involved in those shows for years, but I thought to myself, well, this is a horrific situation. What can we do? And this is sort of around my whole financial literacy thing that I'm into in high schools and when we tour high schools with Shark Tank and all that, I talk about this. When you're young and you're in your 20s, you have to start putting aside 100 bucks a week. I'm trying to make it really simple. The whole idea of bean stocks was to make an app because all the kids work with their phones and so do you and I. You download the app. And all of a sudden, you can just transfer out of your checking account or your savings account 100 bucks a week. And I make it incredibly simple to get a diversified portfolio across a wide range of stocks using ETFs, not necessarily O shares. I'm looking for something that makes it very, very simple. You know, it's very diversified so that they can start to get the benefits of long term investing. And I point out to them look, if you put 100 bucks a week aside, 
from now on, and you can save a hundred bucks or some piece of crap you don't need to buy, and you invest it in yourself, when you turn 65, you'll have a million, four, a million, five in the bank if the markets do what they've done for the last 150 years. And so, the, and you know, you'd say to me, well, there must be tons of apps that do that. And there are, there's trading apps, there's apps that round up your credit cards and all that stuff. But there's nothing that's really simple because these people, I realize, and I'm not expecting them to, they don't know how to trade a stock or a bond. They don't know any of that stuff. And I explained to them, there's a difference between saving, you put a savings account, you make nothing on your cash, and investing that you and I know starts to compound growth over time. That's what I tried to do with Beanstalks, and so far we've been successful. Incredibly simple to invest. You download it, you hook it up to your bank account, boom, bada boom, bada bang, it starts investing for you. Right, and folks, um, what Kevin's talking about, of course, is that, uh, uh, you know, the some people have called it the miracle of compounding, Kevin, um, but it's really simple. I mean, I've been on the Beanstalk site, I've seen how easy it is to invest there, and you know, I've, I've seen numerous articles citing you about how just investing that hundred bucks a week, um, if you start in your 20s, will mean that you've got a million plus. And maybe even depending on, you know, if you're picking which sectors and you end up picking a hot sector, uh, you might even do better than that uh, by the yeah. time you retire. And, you know, so I truly do applaud that because I think so many people just don't get even if they think, Kevin, well, now that makes sense. Maybe when I'm 30, I'll start putting away a thousand instead of putting away a hundred right now. But it's the discipline. It's just like I'm sure, yeah, you know, because I see Kevin on the set, folks. The guy's in shape. Um, you know, sometimes he's wearing the black shirt. Sometimes he's got a white <laughs> shirt with the black tie. But he's always got that black tie. That's that's a constant, Kevin. Stick pin and the black tie. But you're in shape. And you don't stay in shape. Uh, you're a younger man than me, I think, but you don't stay in shape if you don't do something about it. You've got to get out and move around and all the rest. And the same thing's true with investing. If you don't make it a regular habit, it's not going to happen. You know, John, I can tell you what really freaked me out. Some of my CEOs, you know, they're in their early 30s, doing really well, building their businesses, have no concept of, in the great at doing that entrepreneurial thing, have no investment strategy. It just freaks me out. Every dime of their net worth is tied up in their business. And I understand that's what it is when you're starting out. But I keep telling them, you're taking a salary, start diversification, start diversifying, start putting it into something else. We've done a really bad job as a society in teaching kids financial literacy in high school. And you know, I've been, I went down to Florida, they've implemented a new program for high schoolers. They teach them about credit cards, they teach them about investing, they teach them about putting aside money. That's good, we gotta do the same thing in New York, Texas, California next. I'm all over this, John. I'm, all, I'm running around the country on financial literacy because I don't know how you can do it, do it any other way. It's gotta be embedded in your brain. And we don't do it. We teach them math, writing, science, sex education, geography. We don't talk about money. How crazy is that? Like, that's nuts. That's what Beanstalks is all about. Yep. Well, it's a great site, folks, and that's just B-E-A-N-S-T-O-X, Beanstalks, uh, for when you want to look it up and so forth. Um, Kevin, a lot of the companies that you invest in, this is always something that I think it frustrates the judge, which is, of course, Scott Wapner, the host of the Halftime Report. It frustrates him, I think, to some extent, that you and I are so bullish on Facebook. And yeah. I think both of us are bullish on it because geolocation, you know, how else can Kevin, can John reach people in a certain geographic area? You know, you, you, you spend money on a TV ad, which fewer and fewer people do, quite frankly, Kev, except on Shark Tank <laughs> and hopefully on <laughs> Halftime Report. But, you know, you spend money there. You don't really know the demographic you're reaching. You know, you're relying on Nielsen to sort of tell you that, you know, yeah, the average age between this and this, with geolocation and all the data that Facebook has, I don't claim to be an expert on it, Kevin, and I, didn't, I know you don't either, but you spend a fortune, and you say it all the time on CNBC, I spend a fortune, Judge, on you know pushing these companies through Facebook because it's the best use of my dollars. Tell us a little bit why that is, please. Yeah, I, I know Scotty's always on me about that, and you know they wanna break up Facebook and they wanna do this and that to it, but and I, I tell everybody, 
and I'm, I'm a really good index on this because of all these different companies. We try and aggregate our Facebook spend to get a little power to buy at a cheaper rate for some of this stuff because we spend millions of dollars, millions on Facebook. And so just to give you an idea, these companies that I'm an investor in have a choice to spend money anywhere. As you say, it could be television, it could be radio, it could be print, it could be on any digital or social media platform. I just looked at the tear sheets last week for the fourth quarter spending planning for this fourth quarter coming up right now. We're right in it. 81% is going to Facebook. 81%. That's an all time high. That includes Instagram and Facebook. So I start talking to some of these because I talk to them every week. What is it? Why are we, why are you at 81% of every dollar going to Facebook? And you nailed it. It's geo-locked advertising. And here's specifically down to the needle what they're doing. Let's say they're closing their store in Amarillo, Texas, because of the pandemic, because of retail, because whatever else. And they already had a customer base in Amarillo. It's in the panhandle of Texas. Good example. They're doing a geo-locked ad for a 100-mile radius around Amarillo, Texas, to let their existing customers, they're not even trying for new ones yet. They're just letting their existing customers let, let them know that they've set up a Shopify platform where they can service them directly, more convenient than coming into town. What do you think happens? Normally you do a digital campaign like that on Facebook, you're lucky to get a 3% response. They're getting up to 60% response because their existing customers saying, hey, you're still in business? Sure, I'll have it delivered directly to the ranch, to my house, to my condo, whatever it is. <laughs> and so the return on that investment is insanely high and it works. And so. People need to understand whether you're in Champaign, Urbana, or you're Chattanooga, Tennessee, or you're Chicago, you're Miami. It doesn't matter. Facebook can help you maintain your customer base during this period where, where retail is soft. And guess what? We're not reopening in Amarillo. We're never going to reopen our store there. Never. Because we're servicing 66% of our customers direct at 100% gross margin, not 50. And who is that? who's driving all that? Facebook. So am I long Facebook? You bet your wazoo I am. I own a ton of that stock, the maximum I can in any mandate. And I'm, I don't, any politician that wants to bash that up better come up with a better solution for ma and pa businesses in America, which represents 68% of our economy. So not so fast, Mr. Politician. Don't chop up what's working and keeping everybody you know, with food on their table. Facebook is that product right now. Kev, let me switch gears just a little bit and ask you about some of the more exciting uh, companies that you've seen. doesn't have to be Shark Tank, but it could be. Um, but maybe give us an example or two of some of the, the most innovative, or if they're not innovative, at least the ones that you say, boy, that is exactly what the market needs right now. Maybe it's not a new way of doing something. Maybe it's just the better way, you know, that better mouse trap or whatever. What are a couple examples? And, you know, were they Shark Tank or were they Kevin O'Leary getting you know, 50 or 100 emails a day from solicitations of businesses saying, here's my idea, Kev, you should fund me. Yeah, there, there was one a couple of years ago that, and now I, now I can say I'm an investor in the sector, uh, not just the one company, but it's, it's rather eclectic. You are, you, are, you are definitely a student of the cannabis craze. Remember when that started yeah. and it created a huge run up in many of the stocks originally were Canadian, then they moved it stateside and, and that sector is still around. And there was a big promise that it would be involved in medical um, CBD with THC. And, and I, 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 I saw so many deals in that sector. But when I talked to my guys in Washington that do the compliance for me on O shares, they never let me invest in it because they were worried about RICO statute issues between states. Because yes, you know, some states have made cannabis legal, but the feds have not. And there's a RICO statute issue for institutional investors. So I couldn't invest. And so I watched those stocks you know, go nuts and then come, up, come, up, come off. And there's some winners and losers. Two years ago, I get a phone call from a guy who says, look, uh, Kevin, we're, we're, we need a, a big seed round here for some medical research we're doing in psychedelics. I said, what are you, nuts? <laughs> like, I'm going to give you money for LSD and mushrooms and all that stuff? Like, that, that's hippie stuff from the 60s, and it's going to run into the same problem cannabis had. And, and this guy said, no, this is FDA approved trials for microdosing psychedelics for medicine, for opioid addiction. And I think you've heard of this story before. That company was called MindMed. And since then, another one called Compass Pathways was just listed on NASDAQ. I'm an investor in that one too. This is a new form of medicine. And of all the sectors that I've invested in this last year, that's my highest return. 
Now it's controversial. There's no question about it. People are saying, wait a second. Why, why is it? It's a schedule one narcotic, just like, you know, cannabis is, but why are you investing in this one? Because these companies, Peter Thiel's company is Compass and MindMed is, is a deal that's got more compounds than even Compass has. They're all doing schedule one narcotic trials with the FDA. And so that's the difference. Those stocks are up from the seed round 700 plus percent. And I think that trend is still on. So if you ask me some, about something crazy, believe me, that would have never got on Shark Tank. There's no way. We don't put cannabis deals on or schedule one narcotics on the Shark Tank for obvious reasons. But does it have potential to solve for opioid addiction, depression, ADD, all these things? Potentially. And that's why I'm an investor in them. Yeah. Well, folks, the company that Kevin's talking about, he was uh, nice enough to introduce me to uh, MindMed, which is uh, M-M-E-D-F is the symbol. And Kevin, uh, I got to buy you a drink next time we're together somewhere because I almost quadrupled my money in that stock. Because when Kevin said, John, you got to talk to the CEO, just give him a listen. And so I did. I liked what I heard, Kevin. We put him on the podcast. We pushed it out to the folks that you know were listening about uh, PTSD because a lot of what they do, like Kevin said, folks, ADHD, um, certainly that. But then depression and some of the effects of uh, PTSD, you know, from soldiers coming back and so forth that have, or, you know, first responders and all the rest, microdosing of mushrooms, microdosing of LSD and things like that. But this isn't a dispensary play, which is what, when, I, when you first told me about it, Kevin, that's one of the things that immediately came to mind. But it's not that at all. This company's based, I think, in Switzerland, as I remember, Kev. Or at least the, that's the, yeah the trials the trials that they just announced a co collaboration with the Langone you know here in New York and so there's there's a lot of interest in this as a medicine for all kinds of mental ailments and mental health is you know you, you talk about just you know the the drugs for depression or the drugs for ADD Adderall Ritalin there hasn't been a new medicine in 37 years we're pumping our kids full of this stuff we don't know the long term side effects that's why I got involved with it. But it was JR, that CEO you interviewed, that when I talked to him, said, look, I'm about to write you a big check, buddy. I <laughs> want to hear from your lips that you are not going to go into the recreational LSD market. Tell, I don't care what it says on paper. Look me in the eyes and tell me you're not going to do that because I do not want to get involved in that business for, for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, we'll never pursue that. We're just doing clinical studies, trial one, two, three with the FDA to prove these medicines out. That got me done, and, and I'm a big investor, big investor in the space. I've invested in the Peel, Peter Thiel deal too, and I'm an advocate. I, I speak all the time on this space because I'm a really big believer mental health is a massive problem. Just opioid addiction costs the economy billions every year. Yep, absolutely. Um, and uh, like I say, it, it wasn't some wild-eyed guy who looks like a hippie um, that just kind of wants to, hey, man, you got to expand your mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, this guy, you know, he spoke more like a scientist, Kevin, um, yeah. and he's got a real passion for it. Uh, like I say, the company's up from maybe 50, 60 million now. I think the market cap is pushing 300 million, Kev. Yeah, it's been remarkable. People are getting into it now. Some very big name investors getting involved. They want to push it over the top. I think you know, we've got two companies public now, MindMed and Compass Pathways. I think there'll be a third. The other, the, the, the other big horse maybe is that one called Atai. It's still private. I follow this sector like a hawk. So I'm watching market cap growing for all these companies and each of them have different molecules they're testing. Some are focused on LSD, some are focused on psilocybin, some have mo you know, special molecules they've developed. A lot of these drugs do not involve any hallucinations at all. And that's what the, really the, the, what they're pursuing is a medicine that you take that does not affect you you know, your, your sensory abilities, but it does correct some problems you may be having on a mental health basis. So I'm very excited for it. But that's a sector, you know, that came out of the blue two years ago. And mm -hmm. you and I talk a lot about sectoral rotation and all kinds of other stocks. But once in a while, you find something that's brand new, and I got behind it, and I'm going to stay in it. Yep. And I do, I like the model a lot more too, Kevin, because, you know, they're developing intellectual property and all kinds of things around these, around what kind of dosing you'd apply. And they're doing this, like you say, Langone, that's one of the most respected research facilities uh, in the world right there in New York. And they're doing it with various 
Uh, I think he said they've done some things with Johns Hopkins and yep. with various Swiss authorities as well. So th again, this is not a bunch of guys, you know, just kind of experimenting on their own. They're working with true scientists, um, and that's why it's so exciting. Um, Kev, let me let you uh, toot your own horn about something else, um, OGIG, because uh, Kevin's also the, the man behind OShares, folks. I encourage you to look it up. But OGIG, OGIG, this one, uh, I want Kevin to describe how you picked the stocks in it, Kev, because in your short commercials that people might hear on air, they get an idea of how you picked them. But this thing is up 30, I'm sorry, 80% year to date, 80%. I mean, we're doing this show, folks, on the 21st of October. It's up 80%. The NASDAQ, 33. So again, you've picked some of the best of the best of this area. Tell me how you did that and what your focus is when you create these ETFs at OShares. Well, the genesis of OShares, it's an exchange traded fund, it, it's rules based. And so, you know, a couple of years ago, Connor O'Brien, who's the CEO of OShares, I called him up, I said, Connor, listen, you know, I've got all these companies, some of them, 20% are selling abroad now too, selling their products and services. And we are digitizing our offerings. You know, we're, we're, we're selling our products direct to customers. And I've got, a, I want to show you the, the amount of money I'm spending on licenses for all the companies that I'm using to do this. Because if I'm spending that much money, there must be billions of dollars coming out of the rest of the economies that are doing the same thing. And you know, I, I showed them uh, Shopify, for example, how many licenses I was buying on that company to give me the ability to ship direct to my customer. I, I love Amazon, but I don't get the name when I sell through Amazon. I don't know who my customer is. With Shopify, I do. I control my relationship. So, you know, I do a lot with Amazon and they're great people. I would never, you know, not, I want my relationship there. But most of my companies now have set up their own e-stores and Shopify has a million businesses on it. So that was just one name. I said, Connor, can you build me an index of every internet giant company that is out there and first do the research to determine which rules determine success and market cap growth? Is it price earnings ratio? Because frankly, that would have not worked for Amazon 10 years ago. If all you cared about was the PE, you would never have bought Amazon. It was, you know, a thousand PE or an infinite PE when it made no free cash flow. It turns out that sales growth, the actual growth quarter to quarter of revenue and the quality of the balance sheet are two of the most important metrics in, enter, in any internet play. So Connor started to, not just domestically, of course, the, he has the fangs in there, but he found, you know, 70 plus companies around the world that are growing even faster and one of them two years ago was a company called Zoom, which no one <laughs> even heard of. And at that time I became a big shareholder of Zoom and I said to Connor, what the heck is this thing? He said, well, I just looked at the balance sheet. I looked at sales growth. This puppy is on fire. And you know, it came out of Cisco apparently. So I didn't know at the time, but I ended up being a big shareholder of Zoom. So inside OGIG are all the companies globally, not just domestically, the global internet giants, and you talk about outperforming the NASDAQ, it's because many companies in Asia, South America, Canada, Europe, are growing even faster than our traditional FANG stocks. Because, you know, frankly, our FANG stocks have been around a long time, but now they're being emulated by competitors all around the world. And OGIG has all of those. And so, yes, you're right. That thing is up 80% year to date, 100% you know, year over year. And I don't see it stopping, John, because we're in the third oh. inning of digitization. Now I know every single name, Wix.com, DocuSign, Shopify, Facebook, all of those names are part of OGIG. So instead of just owning a few fangs, why not own the entire universe of companies that do the digitization? And it's not just domestic. The Swiss companies, the European, South American, everybody's going direct to customer. And it's the, the OGIG companies that, that are empowering that. That is a story of OGIG. And boy, I'm happy I own it. You know, it's really funny. My son, Trevor, who's an electrical engineer, you know, I, I'm teaching him about investing. I'm, I'm showing him, you know, the strategy of, of diversification. And, you know, I showed him OGIG. I showed him OUSA. I showed him OEUR, my other ETFs. He said, Dad, why don't I just own OGIG? 
why do I need anything else? I said, because you need diversification. <laughs> he said, no, I'd rather have the one that goes up 80% a year. I said, no, Trevor, for every dollar of OGIG, you gotta buy $2 of OUSA, so you have diversification. That, that's, you know, it's wonderful to hear young people about, just give me the ones that go up all the time. Of mm -hmm. course you'd say that. Sure, well, and you know, you sound like Warren Buffett when you talk about that, uh, the diversification, except the part that I like better Kev, rather than just owning Berkshire Hathaway, which has been a great investment for people. Um, I've owned it here and there, but I don't own it right now. Um, I like carving out the alpha, you know, the outperformance. That's what OGIG is. But you're right. Um, you know, is there going to come a time sometime, again, back to our friend Scott Wapner, when Scott turns to you and said, Kev, what about value over growth? Are you ever going to buy value? <laughs> and Kevin's saying, well, you know, I really like growth still. I'm not getting out of it. I'm putting words in your mouth, but I think we've said that together. I'm not getting out of this, but I don't mind you know, putting a little more money into some of these industrials if indeed we're going to get an infrastructure spend, which I think we will get, Kevin. Yeah. And some of these stocks are really battered. So you know, certainly OUSA and some of these other ways to, to play rather than just, but again, back to the FANG names, it's not just five stocks, folks. Right. Another well, I, thing that, I think that's the key is to get yeah. diversification out of just the fangs. And now there's a the talk about regulating the fangs and all that stuff. I don't think that's going to happen as fast as people think. And I get, you know, go back to my uh, Facebook story. Facebook's running America's small business. We don't want to bash it up right now. If you want to bash it up, bash it up after the pandemic's over. But right now it's very important for America. I would say one thing about value because you, you brought up a good point there. You know, the Russell 2000 um, has a bunch of stocks in it about 200 of them are actually profitable. The index on its own doesn't really have return on assets. It's 90 basis points of, of return on assets, which is ridiculous. You should be making nine to 15% return on your assets, but you're not. And so many of those companies are not profitable. But if you go tiptoeing through the tulips, you can find companies that fit into that value equation of domestic that don't have any risk of China trade war stuff that we'll probably get back to after the election. And, and my thought, you know, we built an index for that too called o, OUSM, which is small cap, mid cap, with no REITs in it and no biotech because a lot of those companies make no money. These are only the profitable companies. And lo and behold, it has, it has distributions. And lately, as you've noted, the, vet, the, 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 the Russell's had a, a bunch of good days. You know, it doesn't mean that it's an overall trend coming out of growth, but again, towards this theme of diversification. I'm basically, when I look at my holdings on equities, just to give you an idea, and I use my own ETFs for obvious reasons, John, I, I design them. I have a hand in designing them. OUSA is my biggest position. That's 40%. Those are you know, the subset of the S&P 500. They're the highest quality in there, the best balance sheets. And I need that for my distribution. So, you know, you're making 2% better than cash and you got the best balance sheets. Around 100 out of the 500 are worth owning, in my view, if you do test their balance sheets. And then I do 20% in OUSM, which is small cap, 20% in you know, what I've got in OGIG, which has been the performer this mm -hmm. year, crazy up, it's been great. <laughs> and then I do 10% over in Europe, OEUR, which I got 50 stocks like Nestle and Roche and all that. That's my book, that's my portfolio. I'm totally diversified. And in any one year, I don't know which one of those is going to outperform. This year, it was OGIG for obvious reasons. Might be OGIG again next year. But man, that thing has been fantastic. I'm so glad I own it. But my core holding are the S&P 500 quality names, which are the basis upon which I eat. Those distributions every month, that's how I go buy a hot dog. Well, uh, just to give you guys an idea, again, I'm not trying to, I'm not, my job is not to pump OGIG. But when I was comparing it to all these different ETFs and things, Kevin, I looked at XNTK, which is more or less the fangs. And that is maybe up close to 50%. You're still 30 points over that. I mean, that is incredible outperformance. Um, and you know, it, it speaks to that the, you guys did a great job uh, putting together uh, a broad portfolio of those stocks um, that really are deriving their internet, their money from the internet and so forth. So uh, again, kudos to you. Now you mentioned that, you know, you've got 40% in OUSA, 
and then you mentioned um, the small cap version, the European version, and of course, OBIG. How about gold and silver? Anything in either of those? Yes, I am long gold in two ways. Um, I own the bullion itself and I pay for the storage, big bricks. Um, and I did that because my stepfather is Swiss and he taught me about the, you know, the, the Swiss actually have a very interesting way of using gold as a currency for their citizens. They, uh, when you buy bullion in Switzerland in any bank, a UBS bank in you know, Geneva or Zurich, you get a certificate uh, on the assay value of that, that bar. That bar has a, a serial number on it and it, it comes with a certificate. And the reason that matters is all around the world, when you go into a bank with that bar and they see that Swiss cert that guarantees its assay value to 99.9%, .9%, whatever it is, they don't have to question whether that's a real gold bar. The Swiss have already done that work. And so when he taught me that, and, and, I, and I learned about that system, I bought half my weight in gold in those bars and I like to bring them out you know, on dinners with the kids around and slam down a couple of kilos of gold and say, you will never have this unless you get your own job. You're gonna have to figure out how to go get this. It's fun, it's just fun. Now, to, to balance my gold holdings and various mandates, I use GLD, which by the way, John, is not the cheapest ETF for gold. It's the most no. expensive, but it's got the liquidity. If you wanna move a couple of million bucks in and out in one minute, it's no problem. The bid ask spread against the value of the, of the gold itself held in escrow is very tight. And so it's, it, it, that's how the institutions, a lot of them do it. So when I'm reweighting, I'm using GLD and the cheap way to hold gold is to store it yourself, find a bank, it'll do it for you. But I don't do silver, I know you do. Um, silver to me is more of an industrial metal. Gold to me, people have been trying for years to get me to go to cryptocurrencies and I get it. But my concern is when we talked about crypto, and I know you're very you know, knowledgeable in that space, I thought it was supposed to be an alternative asset against chaos in the stock market, which sometimes gold is. But crypto this year has been, has been at, you know, behaving badly. It's very correlated to the S&P and the Dow. I don't like that. So you know, I, I would have diversified into it, but I want a negative correlation, and I get that with gold. I, th I think going forward, Kevin, you will see uh, crypto diverge and become that uh, contra mover, just like the, the VIX is. The VIX goes up when the market goes down. Uh, many of us expected crypto to do that, but obviously in March and April it didn't. And maybe it was a source of funds, Kevin. You know, maybe some of the people that were getting hurt elsewhere were pulling money out of crypto uh, as well. I don't know. Uh, it's not very, it's not diverse enough yet. In other words, there are so few of us that are in it right now that uh, there are some whales. I'm John, not when you say crypto, you mean Bitcoin, right? You're not, are you yeah. playing with the other ones? Well, uh, I, I play in basically four of them, Kev. Uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum are the big ones. And then I'm in a couple others that are tokens. And people use them for uh, gaming, for instance. Um, yeah. I'm involved in two coins that are really popular with Korean gamers. Because the Koreans are, you know, as much as we love DraftKings, Kev, uh, these, these folks over in Asia just love gaming. And I'm talking about everything from Fortnite to whatever, they're competitive gamers. And in some jurisdictions, they can't win cash. So they win these tokens. And those tokens are securitized on a blockchain. And uh, the people that win those, then, you know, it's, it's almost invisible. It's on their phone, you know, in their wallet or on a Tracer or on some sort of a jump drive, or maybe they've even done like the Winklevoss twins. And taken all of theirs and scattered all these different codes through banks all over the place. The nice thing about crypto is you can move it across borders really easily. I can just walk across a border and nobody knows that I've got X million in crypto uh, and maybe a lot of it's right up here because I just know the codes and so forth. But I know it's not for everybody. I think it's gonna be more, uh, uh, when the institutions get more heavily involved, Kev, and by well, that, the way- I, I wanna turn the tables on you and ask you that question because I'm always intrigued and you know, I could put some serious money to work in it if I, if I could see that it would get institutional support. How long before we get the SEC on board with this 
So I can say, okay, this is an asset class I need to have a 5% weighting in. And, you know, I, and, and whichever they, the right ones are, Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever it is, and I get involved because so far when I talk to sovereign pension and state college, which are the guys I talk to every day for O shares, and I say, what's your weighting in, uh, you know, crypto? Basically, it's zero because they're just not comfortable that the SEC and the regulators are on board for it. How long till we get there? In the next two to three years, I think. Um, and I also think, Kev, that uh, um, uh, the fact that Square is one of the easiest ways through their Cash App, uh, which is, of course, competing with Venmo over at PayPal, but their Cash App is one of the easiest ways uh, to buy crypto. I buy it through a Canadian company that I invested in instead, Kev, called Voyager, Voyager Digital. Um, it's, it's run by a friend of mine, Steve Ehrlich. And they've got a great team up there. It's a Canadian-based, uh, publicly traded company, but they have, I, I, I just maybe they've got over a hundred different cryptos on the platform now. I'm not going to endorse all of those, but I certainly like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Homeros, um, and Playfuel. I like these a lot. Um, but um, I think that now, just today, Kevin, on the 21st of October, I read that. Uh, PayPal has now started to let people trade crypto or at least invest in crypto, pay with crypto through PayPal, just like Square. So Square led the way. Now you've got two of the biggest, um, you know, one's Venmo, one's Cash App, basically uh, helping drive that adoption. Um, so institutions. Well, that, you know, that's, that's very interesting because that's a very credible platform. I tell you why I ask you this question. Okay. When, when I, I, the way I like to buy any asset class is can I index it? And so then, then I design the index and I've got the OShares platform to put it on. I've got the regulators, I've got the lawyers, I've got the infrastructure and I, I can see that I can put up the dollars to get it going. And I want to, cause I help design it. I love the model and that's why I'm going to be, you know, an owner in OShares for the rest of these days on, on this planet. But th the way I look at it is when I went to, 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 to propose an ETF, uh, to the regulators. Before I even got there, I called my guys in Washington saying, look, I want to do an ETF of crypto so I can index it, put in the top 25, whatever it is, find the rules that would index it. They said, not so fast. You're not going to get anywhere with the regulator on that idea. There's three or four applications in already and they're just not on board. But if you're telling me we're a couple of years away, I should go back and sniff around again. Because to me, I would love to just say, okay, index it like give me 20 and let me go five percent waiting and boom blah bang and it would be fantastic yep yep and it's it's storage and it's a whole bunch of issues um that people uh uh you know knock on wood uh bitcoin is uh a really superior uh and the best in my mind uh way to play it but uh there are like you say to get the diversification all of a sudden you're delving into DeFi. you know this decentralized finance and all the rest that um, some of us like, and the regulators certainly don't, uh, don't appreciate. Well, I, I, I like, I like your maverick, you know, the, the, I, I like the fact that you explore these things. You come back to the rest of us and tell us what you know. That's important because you, you're, you're doing the work and sharing the information. So you're, you're kind of my crypto guy, uh, you know, in terms of just listening to what you're doing with that stuff. And so far it's been working for you. But you, yep. you play in the main lane too. You think about all the option work you do around the S&P names and everything else. Like 90% of what you do is very, what, you know, focused on large cap stuff. You're just playing the option fringe on it. Yep. Well, thank you. And, and that is what I love, Kev. I mean, when I was on the trading floor, it was great. When I moved up off the floor, the volumes have exploded because there's a lot more uh, folks in the market. And in this year, 2020, my God, all these Davy Day traders and all the guys over at uh, Robin Hood and E-Trade and TD Ameritrade, Schwab, or you know Fidelity, Interactive Brokers, I mean, we could name them. There are so many more people trading now, especially trading the things that I love, Kev, like you say, those derivatives, the options. I'll, I'll, I know you won't do it, so I'll do it for you. I'll blow your horn on option. <laughs> okay. You, you have helped educate a whole generation of investors, I call them investors, 
particularly on the strategies around call options, um, you know, through your work on CNBC and the seminars you've held. I, there's lots of people that never used options before to augment their income, uh, you know, and you've helped. I mean, there's, you're probably, you and your brother, you, you guys are the guys now in terms of educating people. And I'm not saying wild, crazy stuff. You know, writing calls on S&P names is not a stupid strategy. And, and a lot of people don't even, didn't even know what that was till they, they, they listened to you. So, you know, congratulations. And I think mm. financial literacy, that falls right into one of the things, given your success, you owe everybody, you, you owe to teach the next generation and you're doing exactly that. Oh, thank you, Kevin. You're, you're a gent to say that. And I'd love to work with you on any way of doing that financial literacy. Um, I've talked with uh, Courtney Gibson, for instance, African-American lady that's the president of Loop Ventures um, about, you know, it's really important to get that message out, uh, the financial literacy message, because I think you can rise up or raise up a whole bunch of uh, folks that otherwise wouldn't get that chance um, if they didn't do the Kevin O'Leary and put a hundred bucks away um, every month, um, every week, whatever they're able to. Uh, and for those that do want to learn about it, it's a great way uh, for them to uh, experience uh, the benefits of capitalism instead of demonizing it, right. like some people like to do. Oh, correct. I, that, that is really the, I agree with you. And, and I think if, if collectively the work we do in getting people to start thinking about investing, that is my mission. That is, I'm just trying to tell them, I, what I, the mistake I made in the early years, John, was thinking that everybody knew how to buy a bond and a stock. I was completely wrong about that. I bet you 5% of the population know how to do that. And yet that is the core to any investment strategy and diversification. And so that's the whole bean stocks thing. I've made it so simple that you don't have to ever learn how to do that. And using ETFs and you know, other money markets and whatever else diversification is provided. It's just forcing people's habits to put aside a hundred bucks and not buy another pair of sneakers. That's the hardest part. Right. And think of all the money, Kev, that, uh, I mean, obviously you have to eat, you have to have a place to live. Um, but a lot of folks uh, spend too much money on cars, too much money on clothes before they're able to afford it, actually. Correct. They put some of, and all of that, of course, goes away. I mean, all the, the car depreciates as soon as you drive it off the lot. You know, a great looking suit like Kevin's wearing right now, folks. Uh, you know, what's that worth on the used market? Uh, well, maybe if he <laughs> sells it to, to <laughs> no, the House saying. of Blues, <laughs> and you're a guitar player. <laughs> you know, I, I got I got to tell you the story about you know the, this suit because Shark Tank's been on for 12 years. But in, in the second year, I was talking to the wardrobe guy at the time, um, and and he said, you know, Kevin, let me give you a little tip about television because you're a newbie. You're you're you're, a, you know, if you just wore the same thing every day you wouldn't have to do pickup shots. And I said, what's a pickup shot? He said, well, at the end of every shoot, because you've changed your clothes, they're gonna make you say the same 40 lines over and over again. And you're gonna sit in that chair for an extra hour every day. And I said, you're kidding. All I have to do is find a uniform and wear that and I'll never have to do pickups? He said, yes, because when they shoot Shark Tank, you don't know that deal you're looking at, whether it's going to be in the episode on you know, March or whether it's going to be in April. You have no idea. They, they chop it up. And if your clothes change, that's a problem. You've got to do the pickups over and over again. So I said, well, what do you think? He said, well, let me make you five suits. <laughs> and uh, you know, we got a great tailor. That was 12 years ago. <laughs> I've worn this outfit. I got 25 of these suits, 25 of these ties, 25 of these shirts, 25 of these tie bars. That's all I wear. And I, and I, I say to Cuban, you know, he's got to sit there when we finish shooting at like seven at night for another hour because he changed his jacket, the poor bozo. <laughs> That's the key to success is to look the same all the time. That's well, my strategy. It worked for Stephen Jobs too. Yeah. I mean, how many of those yeah. turtlenecks did he buy? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Uh, you've been a politician. Um, you've run businesses and all the rest. Let's talk about the election. I'm not looking to put you in a box of this guy's liberal, this guy's conservative. I'm just saying, um, what's the best outcome in your mind, Kevin, for stocks right now in the U.S. elections, of course? Yeah. So, John, I spent a lot of time from the policy basis on this, trying to figure out uh, going into this election what to do. You know, I don't think you can time a market, but I'm thinking sectorally. 
So let me just, let me, let me put it in this context. For the last, you know, almost four years, and I'm not, I'm not playing favorites on anything. I'm talking about policy now, not about Biden, not about Trump. The best policy environment that I've ever seen as an investor have been the last, you know, four years, three and a half years, three years, whatever you want to call it. Because it wasn't just tax reform that drove my businesses, particularly my small cap, mid cap, domestic, stateside companies. It was deregulation. That was the secret sauce that really let me grow these companies. All these stupid regulations, both federally, state, and municipal, that got stripped away under the current policy really, really, um, you know, grew my businesses. And so what I care about is policy. And, and um, so I asked myself, let's assume if Trump gets in again, everything stays the same, policy stays the same, that's great for investors, whether you like him, you don't like him. A lot of people, you know, you can talk all day about Trump and Washington, all that stuff. I actually don't care about that. I care about the policy. Now let's assume uh, another another direction. Let's assume a blue sweep, Biden takes over, controls the whole enchilada, everything. It's just a total democratic sweep. What's going to happen? Now, this is the one I'm trying to get my head around. I'll describe to you. He's going to inherit unemployment um, come January because we're going through the second wave of the virus. So we're going to see a little uh, unemployment rise again. He, I, my guess is nine to nine and a half percent unemployment nationally when he takes over. So the number one mandate he's gonna have is to get unemployment back below 5%. We're gonna get, and I agree with you 100%, we're not talking the Biden scenario, a two to two and a half trillion dollar, maybe $3 trillion stimulus package, including infrastructure. That's coming in from the sky into the economy. That's really good for equities. Not so good for bonds, we'll talk about that in a second, but that's really good for equities. Now here's the kicker, everybody's worried about Oh, Biden's going to raise taxes. Well, you can't drop three or two and a half trillion from the top and tax it away before it gets into the economy. So he'll be delaying those tax increases until he can see the stimulus getting his unemployment number down towards five. Then someone said to me, well, what about the new Green Deal? There ain't going to be no Green Deal. Why? Not for the beginning anyways. That's 2.3 million jobs in the energy sector that evaporate if you, if you bash up hydrocarbon. So he's trying to get to his bogey at under 5% unemployment. He's not whacking everybody at energy. He's going to put that on the shelf and say, don't worry, I'm going to get to that later in my mandate. Now, Biden is of the age, and I'm not trying to be critical. He'll never have a second term, in my view. Not because he's a bad guy. I just think there comes a point where you've got to hang it up. And so he'll be a very benign president in terms of bashing the things that you and I care about on policy for the equity markets. And I think the market knows that, John. I think that's why nobody cares about the election. And lastly, on this point that I want to remind everybody, polls do not determine outcomes anywhere. Not in the States, not in England, not in Switzerland, not in Canada, not in New Zealand, not in Australia. They have been 100% wrong 100% of the time. And so if you tell me the polls this, polls that, and you want me to invest on that information, it's worthless. Pollsters are the modern day snake oil salesmen. That's what they are. They have no idea what they're talking about because they don't know. And there's no understanding why it doesn't work. Maybe the farmer in Wisconsin doesn't give a damn about a pollster and lies to him. I have no idea. I don't care. But I'm waiting for election night to determine really what's going to happen because I don't know. But either way, John, you want to be long. That's what I think. And in a split Congress, so whoever is the president, um, if you've got a split Congress, which we have right now, obviously, um, and I don't just mean the president and the Congress, I mean, if the House stays blue and the Senate stays red, then you're not going to see as much crazy legislation go through under anybody, whether it's Trump, because he can push whatever he wants. But again, without the House, which is the purse, he can't, as you always say, show me the money. You know, uh, I love money. You know, Pete and I love when you do that on the halftime report. But when, when you're talking about the money, Nancy, unless she loses the house, controls the money. That's the purse strings. That's why we haven't seen stimulus yet. Um, but if you have a divided Congress, that might be the best under any of these scenarios. Well, let's hope for that. I like it when they can't get anything done because sometimes doing nothing is a great outcome. Just look at where we're at in the markets right now. 
I agree with you. And I think they'll both work out some stimulus deal, whichever happens. And I think it would be great to get another stimulus package. I will say one thing though about the PPP, because I did so many of those loans, 20% of my companies I don't, are, are going to fail because they're, it's not because of the company's fault. Consumer behavior has changed. And I'll give you an idea. Let's say I got a company that services movie theater chains. Well, I don't think people are going back in droves to movie theaters because they've really, over the last eight months, learned how to love streaming. And that's going to change behavior. I noted Disney, and one of the reasons I went back in the name on halftime last week was that they made their focus streaming and they said they're going to drop their tent poles on their own service on Christmas Day, for example, their big releases. They're avoiding theaters altogether because nobody's going to them right now. But I'm just saying that's not going to change. And so why put PPP into the zombie companies? Let those, co and so you say to me, well, what about the movie theaters? Okay, they go bankrupt. So what? We take that building, we turn it into a condo, or we turn it into a climate control pick and pack center, or we turn it into a cloud kitchen, something that the economy needs. And so I, I would rather just do, go the unemployment route and help people in the airline industry, help people in the movie theater industry, help people in the sports arena industry, wherever during the period that those sectors have been beaten up by the pandemic. Because I figure we're into this pandemic thing for another 12 months. You know, we get therapeutics in Q1, we get a vaccine Q2, people start taking it. It takes a while to get the herd inoculated. I think we're gonna be doing this kind of thing for another 12 months, but then there'll be COVID-20 and COVID-21 and the flu and all that <laughs> stuff. I think behavior changes a little bit. Yeah, well, um, and Kev, uh, I'm gonna throw out there that I agree with you about the pollster, first of all, um, that they're almost always wrong. And they're almost always wrong because they choose to be wrong about the way they go about polling and they, they oversample, for instance, Democrats. Now, um, I'm not gonna lie, I am conservative. Um, I, I don't like everything that the president does. I do like what he's done as far as deregulation. I did like the tax cut for businesses because Apple's you know, leaving uh, two or $300 billion overseas made no sense to me. And the reason that they'll always play games with taxes, I point this out and I know you know this to be true. People will always pay as little as they can under the law um, in taxes, whatever they have to do to do that, whether it's a double Dutch Irish sandwich or whatever the hell, or whatever it might be to, uh, to basically pay less, they will do. Um, but um, I appreciate that he's encouraged a lot of that money to come back by our tax structure now. Um, I also think, Kev, that Bloomberg did a nice piece about um, asking who is your neighbor going to vote for? We're not going to ask you who is John, who is Kevin going to vote for? Who is your neighbor going to vote for? Because now you don't feel bad if you're really thinking, well, I'm going to vote for Trump, um, and telling a pollster and having that kid on the other end of the phone think you're a jerk because you said that. Instead, you say, oh, yeah, my neighbor's going to vote for Trump. I'm sure of it. They asked that in Pennsylvania, Kev, uh, and this is based on uh, some polling that they used to do for cars, for automobiles. Um, what kind of car does you, do you want? They, they'd ask every year, and every year people'd say, um, you know, really good gas mileage, doesn't have to be flashy, you know, maybe just if you could, you know, hold it under $12,000 or whatever. Okay, they built those cars, nobody bought them, you know, next to nobody bought them. So then they came around and said, well, what kind of car does your neighbor want? Oh, he wants a sports car. He wants it red, he wants it fast, make a lot of noise, you know, have a lot of fun, convert, convertible top. They started making those and everybody bought them because they didn't want to tell the car manufacturer what kind of car they really wanted, just like they don't want to tell people who they're voting for. Instead, who is your neighbor voting for? That's why I think the polls are wrong I, as well. I, I agree. I have a story for you on polling you're going to find fascinating. Four years ago, almost today, I was doing a wine signing in a suburb of Philadelphia in the basement of a casino because the laws there, you know, I have O'Leary Fine Wines and I've crisscross the country, just like book signings, you do wine signings. The laws in Pennsylvania say that you have to set up a table in the basement of the casino and the line forms, but they can't come together. Husband, wife can't do that. You can only have one person at the table sign the bottle, then they move on. So I show up at the event, it's an evening event, 14 days before the election. They're talking about Hillary being 14% ahead. She's got a big Bruce Springsteen-led event gonna happen. 
in Philly the night of the election. Everybody's talking about it. So I know I'm going to be there for four hours. The line's 500 people right out the door. Thank goodness for O'Leary Fine Wines. And I'm signing bottles. And I got a white piece of paper on the table, just paper, because it's just a card table. This is crazy. But here's, here's what happens. About 20 minutes in, I say, I got, I got America here. I got Philly. I, I got, I'm a pollster. I'm going to start asking these people who they're going to vote for. And I'm just going to take the felt pen and draw it. And the next morning, I was going on Squawk Box. So I said, hey, I got some, something to talk about. So I spent five hours. 480 people were my sample size. Maybe that's not big enough, but they're all in their 30s and 40s. And pretty Philly. damn big. Yeah, pretty good. And, you know, a few wouldn't tell me. But, frankly, most of them did because they were just, one, you know, mano a mano, just one-on-one. Lots of housewives, lots of men. Hillary was two votes ahead out of the whole thing. And I, I said to the producer that night, you know, because we're getting ready for the 6 a.m. call, there's something wrong here. Like, there, there ain't no 14% spread. It's neck and neck. I mean, two, two out of 480 is, is, is irrelevant. Two, you know, so, and she lost big time because people just weren't telling the truth to pollsters. And I guess I'm feeling you know, that you can't use those metrics anymore to make investments on. That was the lesson I learned. And I bet you right now, if you did the O'Leary wine, uh, you know, Philly test, you'd find it'd be pretty close. Well, I was remiss. I didn't mention O'Leary fine wines. Well, I just um, did. I threw it in there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, they are good folks. Um, and he sells them like crazy. Um, home shopping, is that one yeah, no, it's Q- QVC. QVC. QVC came to me a few years ago. The laws changed. You can now ship direct from the winery in California to 42 states. And so now all of a sudden, I, I used to have to go through three tiers of distribution. I made no money. Now I'm partnered with QVC. They buy all my production, 150,000 cases a year, and we sell them together. I go on QVC and we'll sell 3 million bucks worth of wine in 24 hours. And people love the wine. They trust me the way I make it. My wife makes the whites. I do the reds. She's almost a sommelier. She's spectacular. And, you know, we built this family business up from scratch. And unfortunately, the fires are causing chaos, John. You know, it's really hurting that industry. Just getting my juice this year is going to be tough in Cabernets because the shards came off the wines early before the fires, the white grapes. And But now we're harvesting our, our, our cabs. And, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of fire damage. Yeah, well, um, I was lucky enough, Kevin, to meet uh, Francis Ford Coppola a few years ago and uh, his wife, uh, as well as their daughter. And so I've helped uh, raise money for Napa Valley uh, first responders and things like that. But not just Napa Valley, but he's been very generous, as I know you are with charities and things. And I can't say enough about uh, that's a special place, Napa, Sonoma. Uh, you know, even Lodi and uh, yeah. Santa Barbara. I Walla mean, Walla, well, you know, Washington State, Walla Walla Valley. I mean, I, I go there all the time for my wine business. They're special people. They're, they're farmers, really. They love the land. They're heartbroken with what's going on here. And they're scared about the tax propositions coming into California. That's a crazy place. They've got crazy guys running that place. They're just taxing everybody too much. Yep. Well, unfortunately, they're, they're hemorrhaging uh, some of the best job creators, uh, and obviously people like Joe Rogan and Ben Shapiro, uh, but you know Elon Musk. He got so frustrated that they wouldn't let him reopen his Tesla plant that uh, he basically moved down uh, just outside of Austin, I think. Yeah. Um, for his new plant. Yeah, my my son works for Tesla. He's an electrical engineer. He was an intern there for two years. Loves the company. You know, it, it just it, it's frustrating when. when politicians go too crazy. You really want the middle of the road because the real engine of the American economy is the entrepreneur. And you don't want to, you don't want to piss them off. You want to keep them in your state if you got them. Well, um, folks, we've been having a great conversation with a great entrepreneur and a good friend. Kevin, can't thank you enough for coming on, sir. Um, It's always a pleasure to be on television with you. You've been kind uh, enough to join us at our conferences, and I hope we can do more of that in the future. So, Kevin O'Leary, folks, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, John. I loved it. Time flew by like that. You're a great dude. Oh, thank you, sir. Take care. You as well.